Hello, everybody. So, so my name is Randy Dybel, and I am in the Department of Philosophy at the New School for Social Research in Manhattan. And my talk is called An Ontological Interpretation of Laws of Form. Um, but I also just changed it up a bit um, this morning. <laughs> um, I was going to start with some of the stuff we're familiar with, like Luan, Varela, you know, just to give us like a, a philosophical, um, you know, overview so that I could then lead us into more philosophical, other philosophical things, um, because that's what I'm doing with it. But in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take a couple pages worth of time um, telling my story, because that's really where I'm coming from, of course. So I'm going to do that, and then I'm just going to um, tell you what I think about laws of form. OK, so, so here's my story. It's going to start, um, it's, it's quite autobiographical. <laughs> OK, when I was a kid, I had some experiences that impressed upon me the importance of remembering my inner states of the joy and innocence and profundity of life. I mean, that's what you are motivated to remember, you know, all the other stuff, of course, but before I had words to name them. Now I use these words and my aim, and they aim my philosophical devices back to that, um, activating my memory of such states tied as they were for me to trips to the tropical jungles floating on my back in the pool at the tropical hotels. You know, just all these experiences. These are the places um, that I was at. I happened to be at where I, I had these wonderful experiences. And the reason I was trying to remember these is because summer was ending, inevitably school was beginning, and there would be a year full of homework and, and all that negative stuff, you know, <laughs> that would take me away from the miracle of existence. Um, so this is just an example um, using some of the tokens of childhood happiness that I used to remember these inner states. I treasured them. We all treasure our inner states, you know, the, the beautiful ones. Um, I set fast on the work of reviving these states through memory by a chain-like procedure. Um, I knew that I was going to forget their full reality as a dream fades away from complete and total gripping reality into oblivion. Even just sharing this chain procedure with you today brings it back a bit, uh, like when we keep a dream journal and only have to start writing to remember more and more of the narrative. Of course, the explanation, uh, explanation proceeding in the order of the syntax of writing is not at all how the reality was experienced. I mean, Plotinus does point out that the uh, syntax by which we fall into time from eternity is the same syntax of language, but this can't be limited to the syntax of propositional expressions of thoughts on a line. When we write a dream, we produce a chain of thought on a page in a fever of recollection. That's what I mean. And this kind of procedure is something I had to do very consciously and longitudinally. It was a different procedure with more words when I was older, than when I was younger, but I did it. I did something like that, anyway. Uh, whether I really recorded interstates or only conjectured something like them doesn't really matter. The connection to the content, real or imaginary, uh, it doesn't matter which, only the connection to the content is what really matters. Uh, I can still recall even now the depth of the profound interstates I was motivated to consciously remember. When I do this now, it is a composite, compounded thing tied to photographs, and scenes rather than feelings and actual inner states. Maybe it's just the idea of these things, but I can get into some good feelings from it anyway. Uh, when George Spencer Brown went through all the trouble of remembering his inner states, it was not so lovely, but the result, he tells us, was the reconstruction of the laws of the holocosm, the laws of form, the indication, the uh, calculus of indications. This is very good. I thank him. And I'll pay for it by believing that he channeled the alien intelligence of the Tathagata to do so. 
And it's really not so far a stretch to say that he was indeed the Buddha Tathagata for having done so. <laughs> I remember, there's just a couple more pages of this autobiography. I remember staring at the ceiling in Mission Beach, San Diego at 805 Venice Court back when I was six years old after having traced with my finger the imported patterns on the edges of the table from Mexico that we had in our living room. I stared at some point in the ceiling and thought, before I had the words to articulate it precisely, does a point need to stop in order to change direction? Now, I remember remembering this when I was little. Of course, I didn't have the words for it. It didn't have this deep philosophical meaning, but it was what I was thinking, you know, and I, I tried to, to remember that. Um, I had to keep trying to remember that over many years. Now, I can think about the ideas of infinite velocity and perfect breaking and the problems of continuity and discontinuity and so on in order to get back there to the question I formulated on the ceiling at the beach. But the original formulation of the question got all the necessary intuitions to give me a proper context in which to ask the most fundamental question. Back then, I knew it was an important question, and I had no evidence that it was anything like the negative inner states of Spencer Brown that he tells us about with, with his mother or whatever traumas he went through when he reconstructed, you know, when he was from the autobiography, like when he was born and his, he saw his memories coming out of his umbilical blood, you know. Um, I don't know if that was helping him figure out laws of form, but right, trauma from, from his mother. Um, <laughs> for which he later forgave her. Um, back then, I knew it was an important question. But um, so maybe the, the gripping negativity of his experience of isolation gave him the fully immersed analog of this question, whereas mine was only a spectacle at the distance of couch to ceiling. I certainly prefer mine, framed by the positivity of the beaches and the tropical jungle. Or was it a lighter version of negativity, perhaps? Um, in the unmarked state of my clear blue sky above the pool of the Catamaran Resort Hotel down the street from my house, there could only be an internal negativity, not an external one, of summer's end, denoting childhood's end, meaning the inevitability of the end of life. It certainly felt like the end of life, the beginning of homework. Still, I don't claim to be a genius because of thinking such sad thoughts. Okay, I'm being ironic. Okay. It was a little later, when I returned to these thoughts at psychedelic peak experiences, that I was able to use them to get it all sorted out. I became increasingly convinced that I had figured out the necessary foundational structure of experience by then, through introspection and intense conjectural inference. I found a copy of Alfred North Whitehead's Process and Reality, and read it all very passionately, in the first chapter, Whitehead lays out the meaning and method of speculative philosophy. Speculative philosophy, he writes, is the endeavor to frame a coherent, logical, necessary system of ideas in terms of which every element of our experience can be interpreted. I think I was 14 years old when I first read this. Around that time, I had already pieced together my filium Ariadna to the heavenly inner states of youth. I'm not saying it was all perfect, um, but I would not say that Spencer Brown's childhood was all bad either. The thoughts that convinced me that there was a heavenly foundation to reality, that reality was far more vast and profound than we could imagine by the method of exhaustion, and that this foundation in the depths of the imagination had something systematic to do with the nature of the infinitesimal point. Putting this conviction together with the intuitive evidence of the basic metaphysical position articulated by Buddhism, the Buddhism popular among my California neighbors, I knew that there was some kind of special connection between this first thing as infinitesimal point and the ultimate reality of shunyata. Every science, Whitehead writes, must devise its own instruments. The tool required for philosophy is language. A page later, he continues, a precise language must await a completed metaphysical knowledge. My original copy of Process and Reality is thoroughly marked up, and this, this line is starred and marred beyond readability. It's a very important point, and one that is particularly meaningful in the context of laws of form. But at the time, I had never heard of laws of form. I then came out of my peak experiences declaring with conviction that I had figured out the completed metaphysical system. I had to do, it had to do with what I call the ontological procession of dimensionality. 
Already then, I knew this procession of existence arose from the ultimate reality called the absolute infinite. I had figured it out. Then, I found John Lilly's books. I read them fast. I learned about how Lilly used a mathematical text called Laws of Form to travel into other universes in his invention of the isolation tank. I got Laws of Form and determined to figure it out. I read the Esalen transcript, and I learned that Spencer Brown thought it was a way of, in fact, getting back to this universe, which made a lot more sense. Um, and it was, it was all making sense to me. So I called up George Spencer Brown around the age of 15, and very slowly and as respectfully as possible made my way to telling him that I had figured it all out. <laughs> and that I found laws of form to be the most precise language, language able to articulate the completed metaphysical knowledge in what he had sensed. He was pleased. He recognized that I was enlightened. <laughs> By which is simply meant that I know that in reality, there is nothing that is you know, in ultimate reality. And that all of this is the result. That was enough. And he conferred upon me the title of Sentinel in his organization, Charati. This might mean all sorts of esoteric secret transference over the years, since I was keen to this level of our relationship. But, but he also made me his New York agent when I moved to New York and had me call up the big publishing houses to convince them to publish his work. So he gave me many offices. Um, it was the beginning of a friendship over many years between him and all the members of, on my end in New York and in California. Uh, over those years, I went from an individual study of cybernetic metaphysics and systems philosophy as a member of the American Society for Cybernetics to the academic pursuit of philosophy and eventually phenomenology, which I continue today. Having found a couple other very interesting things and seeing how they can be related to laws of form, my present work on a phenomenology of the spheres establishes the insights of ontological phenomenology in the economy of laws of form and its metaphysical foundation. Okay, so framed by the question, does a point need to stop in order to change direction I will now demonstrate the ontological dimensional interpretation of laws of form. So I'm going to draw some diagrams here. How am I on time? Great. So anyway, I just I wanted to share, you know, how I came to laws of form, why I think it's worthy of defending the Buddha Tathagata position of our master. Um, because th this, is, this is really important. The important thing is the interpretation of these level, you know, one or zero, the unmarked state, the marked state, what their ontological nature is, and then what they, what they mean, how they could be employed. Certainly there's the like five levels of eternity corresponding to the, the kinds of mathematics, you know, the unmarked state, and then there's the first distinction, and then the, the initials of the calculus, and then the primary arithmetic, you know, and, and so on. There's this way of looking at it, but there's many different ways of interpreting laws of form. But the really important, powerful thing about laws of form, well, I mean, it is at every level. All these economic ways of looking at all these different things that all come together, you know, where they co come together is what's really important. So, so my previous presentation um, was a sort of explanation of like ancient precedents to these things. So like the unmarked state. Uh, oh, I don't know if I have a, yeah. So just turn it off. Um, so let's say this is the unmarked state, right? This is the, the void, according to Spencer Brown, right? Because he's using the Buddhist terminology. It's shunyata. So it's the nothing in that sense. Now it can't be pure and radical nothingness because then there couldn't be any of this. None of this would exist. You know, I mean, this is, a, this is a thought experiment. Um, instead, there are all sorts of mystical traditions, Christian mystics, for instance, like um, Jakob Volna, Eryujana, etc. You know, they have this term, das nichts, the nothing. So when they say that, it means something very specific. There, there's other terms for this beyond of being. Of course, the Plato, Epikinia, Tessusias, the beyond of being, 
It is for Plato the good, Agathon. Um, even before him, the pre-Socratics have it as apairon. Okay, so Dr. Gunther uses the term proemial relation to describe the relation between the unmarked state and the first distinction. Also, I think he extends it for um, self-reference and hetero-reference. Um, so, in the ancient Pythagorean stuff, and this is indeed what Plato is also um, building his work upon, um, there's, there's these, these two things. So, um, so, of course, you know, there's the beyond of being, but what we're really familiar with is the one, the big O one, a hypostatic, unparticipated one. Now, even in Greek scholarship, within specifically within the, the, the confines of academic philosophy, there is plenty of misinterpretation or not knowing what that means, um, and, and it's controversial too. You know, um, so here's here's the thing: the first distinction on my reading is the one. The unmarked state is the beyond of being, call it um, apairon. And then there's, um, there's a, a process by which that relationship between the one and the beyond one thing, uh, probably the best term for it, better than nothingness, would be the infinite. And to be clear, the absolute infinite. Um, so, OK. So, what, so real quick, let me, um, let me tell you what I think the nature of the one is. This is the nature of the first distinction. OK. So obviously, we all know, because we all love laws of form, is that this little dot here, well, you can't see it from the other end of the room. You can't really see that. So um, we use some kind of token to mark. Oh, you see it. OK, yeah, okay. It. all right, well, then fine. But um, there's, there's different ways of marking it. So, in, so here, here's real quick the, the thing in Greek. This is called, um, Plato uses this, a crossing like this. The thing is actually there. That's the point. You're, you're like showing that it's equally distant. So the thing is actually present. And this is called stigma. This is George Spencer Brown's magic marker, by the way. <laughs> um, thank you, Graham. OK, so stigma. There's also semion. And this means that the thing isn't there, it's only, it means sign, right? it's only indicated. So to see from the back of the room, I'll just add more arrows to show you. So the point is, in this case, you have the definition of the point such that it's there. There's something actually present, a mark. And then in this case, there's nothing there. So this is, this is the issue in, um, in the Greek academic discussion of, of like what is the point. But let me just show you another perspective on what I think the, um, the first distinction is. OK, so, so obviously we all know that the little dot marked as, like, let's say, that there, right? That thing um, is not originally in like a plain two-dimensional space. In fact, ideally, it's not in any dimensional space at all. So the, the best way of conceiving what this is, is in fact, if this is much better on a napkin, but if you take the dimensional context, we, you know, being like, I don't know, topologists and everything, you know, we've seen people do this kind of trick before, where you take the actual piece of paper and you, you wrap it up, right? Oh, if I continue the dot along this way, and then I come around the other side, this is like, you know, genus one topological space kind of situation, right? <laughs> I'm not the expert topologist in the room. But here's, here's a, an even better way of representing it. Okay. The pen that you use to make that mark, let's say, um, this, this is like, if it, it like kind of sucked it all up, like the singularity black hole, because the point is, this is radical singularity, you know, the oneness of the one. There can be no dimensional context for it. Okay? So it's really, really, really tightly like that. Um, anyway, I think we're somewhat familiar with that sort of thing, having discussed 
um, you know, how the, the edges come together, the, the first law is that, you know, any multiple instances of the thing is really just the thing. Um, because the first distinction that we have to consider methodologically when we proceed to understand laws of form is the distinction between distinction and indication, or the difference between difference and reference, or like difference in itself, you know, um, or the first distinction. So all of this is contingent on the idea that there is a first distinction. I'm running out of time here, but um, so the, the, the point is, I feel like I've <laughs> really just begun. Um, so, so there can be only one first distinction, and you know the the next thing that happens, the the two initials of the calculus govern the radiation of it. Um, Maybe I can have a, another couple minutes here. If you don't, okay. I only have 10 minutes for questions if you don't. Oh, okay, okay. All right, cool. So five minutes for questions this time. So, um, so anyway, the, the unmarked state is like the nothing or whatever, but in the, the ancient Greek world, one interesting way of looking at it is that when you have this, this perennial relation between ultimate reality and penultimate reality, um, suddenly there's, there's a relationship on both ends. Um, not that there's anything happening, and not that there's like a circle drawn on a plane, or you know, for some reason already we have like a given three-dimensional volume space, but there's this idea that the one, the infinitesimal point, or the hypostatic unparticipated one, is the limit, paros, of apiron, and apiron, so paros means limit, right? And a pyron, this is the alpha primitive. This becomes the in, the not of the finite. So we get your word infinite from a pyron. Okay, but so the paros, like that, is the center, the, the center of all centers. And the a pyron is what's called the infinite sphere. So the nature of the infinite sphere is like all paradoxical. Nicholas of Cusa is, you know, a great example of, of like talking about this sort of thing. George Boulay, Metamorphoses of the Circle, goes over this. Um, you've all heard maybe of the um, God is an infinite sphere whose center is everywhere and periphery is nowhere. Pascal. You know, right, Pascal. But that's in fact Prop Two of Twenty Four Propositions. The Book of the Twenty Four Philosophers is what that's from ultimately. Um, but so anyway. There's so all these interesting ways of formulating this idea of the infinite sphere. But my point is that the way I've always thought of laws of form, and the way it works, I think, for John Lilly, who's doing it experientially, such that the first distinction is the being in itself, the pure self-referentiality, like the pure ego, the transcendentally pure subject, you know, in the center of the tank, the observer of all that darkness and, and silence, you know, in the tank. Um, and then the infinite sphere is this, this like mathematical phase space, is how John Lilly thought of it. Um, equivalently, it's the in indicational space. Um, phenomenologically, it's called the phenomenological disclosure space. But anyway, so there's no dimensions yet. There's only this prefacing relation between the first distinction and all the, um, it, it, it's not the many, but um, this is where all the other distinctions, you know, lie. But they're not distinctions. You know, it's they're indications of what of the first distinction. So anyway, I think I'm I'm out of time, unfortunately. Um, but that, that's so that's at least the beginning of, of the lesson I think that I'm, I'm able to share. Um, so I'll I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> this is high magic. Uh, of course, but it is. Uh, a paradox we live in it. The Euclidean point is that which has no uh, parts. That which cannot be divided, yes? Has no parts. Yeah. 
spends and rounds, the first distinction is perfect continence. It has an inside and outside of the, uh, boundary. The inside can be divided. Unpack that paradox, please. The inside can be divided. Can, yeah, must be. If it the has outside, an inside. Too. And the outside, yeah. But yeah, I mean, you're this, saying this happens first, at another level. You said the point is the first distinction, is the first yeah. distinction. Yeah. Spencer Brown says the first distinction is perfect continence. What right. does your first. point contain? The first distinction is, so he, he uses different ways of putting it, right? It's an infinitely sensitive film upon which all this can be, can, you know, impressed, blah, 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 um, and so on. Um, so containment of other things is containment of indications of the first distinction. In the first case, there's pure self-referentiality. So any sign, any indication, or any stuff later becomes material existence, and all this, you know, is contained by the like cosmic closure, the ontological closure of of that you know continence in the sense of like closure. Okay. So it does come to contain all of these things, but that exists on another level. Because at the same time that you have your idea of the first distinction or your possibility of the first distinction, you know, the ground for all the indications of the first distinction, which is all this, you also have the unmarked state. The unmarked state is all around and in between, and you know, it's, it's always already is usually how philosophers talk about that presence of. God or the infinite or whatever, and then the the in philosophy it's the actus purus, you know, um, and this thing is ever present. So they use these special formulations, always already, because it's before or after or whatever. The alpha and omega, the alpha and omega is ever present. It's like the ever present origin. John Gosser, excellent book, great title for describing the nature of this that which there can be only one of. So in a strangely paradoxical way, you know, it's everywhere. It's the center that is everywhere because the periphery is nowhere, you know. So anyway, I, I think, is, is that okay? Like, like the Euclidean, specifically Euclid's definition is, um, you know, there's different ways of, of reading that. Um, you know, was Euclid, Euclidean? This is the point is that which has no part. Right. Exactly, that which has no part. No sides. Right, no sides and stuff, right? yeah. yeah. But I mean, Euclid's whole method is definition of elements a posteriori by things that are a priori. So it all depends on what is the point? What is the nature of the point? The point is that which there can be only one of. You know, it's this radical singularity. And it's ever present among all the indications of it, all the possible worlds. Well, I, I, when you when you when you talk about all this stuff, I wonder where the observer is, and maybe I can uh, uh, can uh, answer give my answer to uh, the questions here, um, because um, the way I've always thought about the first distinction is when I it's a personal one, I suppose when I make the first distinction, it is not me, not the observer, and not me is the world. So in, you know, I, I think of your picture is the dot is me and, and I can't make a distinction in myself as an observer without getting into some sort of re-entry loop of self-contradiction. I think that's a bit Lemanian as I remember from 30 years ago. Um, so I'd say the dot is the observer and you make all your distinctions of things in the world. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so self-reference in the first case, as the first distinction, because it's highly implicit in there. You know, Burrell missed it, right? He made this third value of explicit self-reference, you know, for example. Um, it's totally implicit, and so it's easy to miss the fact that the first distinction, one way of looking at it is that it is pure self-reference. I mean, what does that mean? So this is another paradoxical formulation because self-reference is the property of, like, doing this, or an ego, you know, ego is usually, we think of it, I think, usually as like an ego vehicle, like some thing, like, I'm Randy, I'm some guy, or, you know, it's not 
Das Reine Ich, the mystical ego in the sense of like the transcendentally pure, pure subjectivity, you know. Other traditions, like in Vedanta, you have your Param Atman, the Purusha, you know, or in, in contrast to the Atman doctrine, the Buddhists have the Anatman, you know, but in any case, um, these, these mechanisms are still there, even if they're articulated in different ways. Can the observer observe itself observing? Can the observer observe itself observing? Not at first. Yeah, not at first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, so that's isn't that like exactly the the way of denoting the levels? Like in the S one Q is the like. Well, there's being, and then there's being, seeing being, and then there's being, seeing being, seeing being. Yeah. I mean, this is another way of saying that there are five orders of eternity. That's like another way of laying it out. You know. So if you have another distinction, that's 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 the like. Yeah. See, yeah. Yeah. I think it always helps to try to come down from where or where we normally exactly speak exactly. And, and watch what happens when we try to go into that limit. So we, we tend to say, well, a distinction arises with an awareness right, of, right along with it. And that, that's how we tend to speak. Yeah, well, as a form, in the normal form. And then a first distinction would have to arise along with an awareness. But if there's a distinction between the awareness and the, and the first distinction, then that wouldn't be a first distinction anymore. So the nothing is so unstable uh, that the first distinction is fundamentally paradoxical. It's only self-referential, but it can't make any reference. And, it, and if it were, it would just disappear. Right. Yeah, I mean, so the disappearance, it would disappear into what? Into the same, like, translucency of the pure It would never disappear either. quite. But... It never quite appeared. Never quite appeared. Yeah, right. The, the first distinction certainly never can appear because it's always the like the center. So when you have eyeballs, if you're like an organism, you know, then it's going to be behind those. If you have earballs, you're like an organism with ears, you know, then it's going to be behind those. Like it's always going to be tucked away because instead, you know, the object is the is what takes on that that signif significant nature, you know. So anyway, I mean. Maybe like my method all along has been to snake around all those questions, and that's why I'm a philosopher. <laughs> but the way that that's done, I think, is coherent. You know, you're coherent. Oh, thank you. It's nice to be told that I'm coherent. Such a right. yeah, maddening. <laughs> right. If I, if I can yeah. use the uh, the uh, immortal words of Taylor Swift, you gotta calm down. <laughs> all right. Yeah, thank you. Uh, if, do, ontology is actually something really, really complicated, and it, it's even doubtful where we that we can do it, right? A few people have tried, and failed miserable so far, uh, and we keep on looking into what they say, trying to extract information. Also, actually, about who those yeah. people are. I want no, to no, the out. ones. This all is the ones me you ontology. This is the non-being science of non-being. You know, me ontology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that. The, me ontology is even more ethereal, if anything, than ontology. It's even more difficult. Which is why we need to publish it. It so sounds like a terrific <laughs> topic for dinner. Um, yes, but we're sadly out of time here. So we have to uh, come to the next point. So thank you, Randy. Thank you very much.